how do we reconcile the natural laws that David is describing with the practice of economics? Uh, for that, I think we have to turn to an economist, and I want to bring up Peter Victor. He lectures in environmental studies at York University in Ontario and is also a former assistant deputy minister at the Ontario Ministry of the Environment. But he's here to offer his response from the perspective of ecological economics. Please join me in welcoming Peter Victor. Thank you, Kai. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm truly honored to be sharing the stage with David Suzuki and Miles Richardson and to be participating in the opening event of the uh, CANSI UC conference that starts in earnest tomorrow when we start hearing all of the different presentations on ongoing uh, research. Well, David has laid down the challenge. How should we as ecological economists respond? I'm going to suggest three ways. First, to remind ourselves of the origins of modern ecological economics and some of its main ideas. Second, to understand what a daunting task it is to successfully challenge mainstream thinking and vested interests. And third, to outline a plan of action for doing just that. Some 50 years ago, the eminent economist Kenneth Boulding observed in his seminal paper, The Economics of the Coming Spaceship Earth, that we need to transition from a cowboy economy, which assumes an endless frontier and uh, unlimited resources, to a closed spaceman economy in which conservation and recycling are paramount. He called for a change in the dominant worldview of economics uh, based on an appreciation that the economy is a subsystem of the biosphere governed by the laws of thermodynamics. He also noted the dependency of economic growth on fossil fuels, which he described as a short-term supplement to solar energy. Add to this his novel views on the determinants of human well-being and his observation that the practice of discounting may compromise the interests of future generations, and you realize that in the mid-1960s, Boulding was laying the foundations for what later came to be called ecological economics. Well, since then, ecological economists have made real progress on several fronts. For example, we've begun to quantify the dependency of the economy on the biosphere, and we have critically examined the meanings and measurement of prosperity. Yet our contribution to public discourse remains minimal, as the current election campaign in Canada illustrates only too well. All of the main political parties are trying to persuade us that they have the best plan for growing the gross domestic product. Yet we know that GDP tells us nothing about distribution, social justice, sustainability, resilience, and environmental degradation. Alternative macro measures developed and or promoted by ecological economists to overcome these deficiencies include the ecological footprint, the genuine progress indicator, the human development index, something called HAMP, which stands for uh, the, a measure of the human appropriation of the net products of photosynthesis, the Happy Planet Index, and one of my favorites, the energy return on energy invested. So we, we are trying to tackle the deficiencies in GDP, but the problem is that the alternative measures that we've come up with are still considered rather peripheral. We've also made many proposals for the kinds of policies and more fundamental changes required for a future, to, future that is better than the one we are currently facing. And I mean better for the many, not just the privileged few. Some of us, have even dared to question the desirability and feasibility of eternal economic growth. Of course, we have many questions that further research is, is required for, and we'll hear a lot about the ongoing research of ecological economists in Canada and the US at our conference, which begins in earnest tomorrow. Now, in setting up this event, David and I were asked to exchange views on what both of our fields need to learn from each other in order to come to a truly ecological economics that illuminates how human well-being can be secured within the planet's limits. As you no doubt appreciate already, David and I agree on a great deal despite our different academic starting points. Still, Thinking of ecologists and natural scientists more generally, there are things which I would like them to appreciate better if we are to build a more effective ecological economics, and I'll mention four. First, economics has a very rich intellectual history with many schools of thought and contested ideas. There is far more in the subject than might appear from the inordinate dominance of neoclassical economics that is fashionable today. 
So do give economics a chance. It's a powerful way of understanding the economy, what it is, how it functions, and what the possibilities are for beneficial change. Second, economists are often guilty of thinking that nature is infinitely malleable and that with the right incentives, technology will overcome any constraint. But all too often, natural scientists make the parallel and equally fallacious assumption that since the economy is a human construct, it can be easily reconfigured to accord with their understanding of how biophysical systems work, if only it were that simple. Third, if we're going to change our ways, then we're going to have to make different and better decisions. While scientists often tell us a great deal about how the natural world functions, all too often the information they provide is not very helpful for making more informed decisions. Now, this is partly due to the fact that a lot of science is curiosity-driven, as it should be. But we also need applied science that is deliberately intended for use in decision-making. It is often the decisions that have to be made that should determine the science that needs to be done, rather than the other way around. And this is not always appreciated by scientists. Fourth, ecological economists work hard to integrate ecology into economics. And to do that, we do our best to read and understand the natural sciences. At the same time, all too few natural scientists make an effort to understand economics. Much of this is due to the compartmentalization of knowledge into separate disciplines. But if more natural scientists would become conversant in economics, as well as the wide range of other subjects needed for a more effective ecological economics, we would all be further ahead. Well, now, there's much we can do to strengthen and improve ecological economics, but that's not our main problem. Rather, it is to expand the influence of ecological economics by getting our worldview, our ideas, and our research better appreciated by the public and the powerful. How might we do that? It helps to consider how the dominant worldview came about and to realize it wasn't by accident. So let me take you back to the 60s and early 1970s, when there was a lot of excitement about building a more just and inclusive society and saving the environment. Corporate leaders, however, were becoming increasingly disturbed by the apparent threat to their interests. So in, 19, uh, sorry, in, in August 1971, at the request of the US Chamber of Commerce, Lewis Powell, then a corporate lawyer, representative of the tobacco industry and a member of the boards of 11 corporations, prepared a confidential memorandum entitled Attack on American Free Enterprise System. In his memorandum, Powell described what he saw as an attack on the American economic system by progressive forces, and he set out a detailed plan of action for the US Chamber of Commerce to combat this attack. Quoting Powell, the most disquieting voices joining the chorus of criticism of the American economic system come from perfectly respectable elements of society, from the college campus, the pulpit, the media, the intellectual and literary journals, the arts and sciences, and from politicians. And his plan took aim at all of them. He described the apathy of business in the face of this attack and urged the adoption of an educational and political program involving many components. Here's a few that stand out. Powell called for the expansion of the role of the US Chamber of Commerce, whose, quote, strength lies in organization, in careful long-range planning and implementation, in consistency of action over an indefinite period of years, in the scale of financing available only through joint effort, and in the political power available only through united action and national organizations. He suggested a range of activities directed at campuses and high schools to influence faculty appointments, curricula, and textbooks in the name of balance. He made proposals for monitoring and influencing television, radio, and the press, specifically to favor business. He said that efforts should be made to obtain more publications of the right kind in scholarly journals, books, and pamphlets. He proposed much greater use of advertising devoted to, and I quote him again, supporting the system, saying that if American business devoted only 10% of its total annual advertising budget to this overall purpose, it would be a statesmanlike expenditure. He urged much more involvement by business in what he called the neglected political arena, saying, and I quote him again, political power is necessary, that such power must be assiduously cultivated, and that when necessary, it must be used aggressively and with determination. 
He specifically identified consumerism and the environment as areas where politicians apparently are stampeding to support almost any legislation and needed to be opposed. And about the courts, he said, quote, the judiciary may be the most important instrument for social, economic, and political change. Two months after he submitted his memorandum, Powell was nominated by President Nixon to the US Supreme Court. Summing up, Powell said, it is time for American business, which has demonstrated the greatest capacity in all history to produce and to influence consumer decisions, to apply their great talents vigorously to the preservation of the system itself. So you see, the worldview that we are confronted with today didn't come about by accident, but was very much the carefully thought out plan of some very powerful people. But of course, Powell was not the only voice calling for such a program of action but it is the one that can still be heard across the generations for the aggressive defense of what he variously called the free enterprise system, capitalism, or the profit system. Now, while our interests in changing ideas and practices are not the same as Powell's by any means, there are lessons for ecological economists in the Powell Memorandum. If we want our ideas uh, to have influence beyond the margin, then first of all, our aim should be clear. We want ecological economics in the mainstream. Economic students are already taking action to give ecological economics and other heterodox views more prominence in their education. In 2011, when students at Harvard objected to the conservative bias in the mandatory introductory course in economics, it made the national news. Then last year, the International Student Initiative for Pluralism in Economics was formed and now is a collaboration of 82 associations of economic students from 31 countries around the world. This all goes very well for the future. As the Powell Memorandum makes clear, organization with a long-term plan is essential. Ecological economists have our international, regional, and national societies. Up to now, their primary function has been to facilitate the exchange of ideas among members. Now it's time to do more. We should collaborate with groups working for a just and ecologically resilient society and build a broad-based movement. We can't hope to have our ideas become more influential unless we work effectively with others who share our goals. Clearly, we face an uphill battle. In the half century since Balding wrote his essay, the human population has more than doubled, the global output of goods and services has increased over eight and a half times, and the burden that humans are placing on the biosphere has, in many respects, surpassed its capacity to support us. Just how we might succeed has been set out in, in an imaginative and amusing rewrite of the Powell Memorandum, written for the executives and members of the Canadian Society of Ecological Economics and the US Society for Ecological Economics. Powell called his memorandum Attack on American Free Enterprise System, the rewrite is called Attack on the North American Environment. It uses much of Powell's language and ideas, but it is directed towards the promotion of ecological economics rather than corporate interests. The confidential Can You See version and the original Powell memorandum are posted on the CANSI website for all to see. To close, we, have to do, we do have some good things going for us. We have an approach to economics that incorporates principles of the natural sciences. This allows us to make sense of the daily barrage of bad news about human impacts on the biosphere and the consequences for all species, not just humans. And we are open to different ethical frames other than utilitarianism. We have much to offer in terms of real solutions relating, economic, relating to economic issues such as investment, finance, enterprise, employment, trade, prices, and taxation, all stemming from an appreciation of the dependence of the economy and society on the biosphere. And we have social media, which didn't exist when Powell wrote his memo, giving us the capacity to interact with literally billions of people at little cost. Finally, we have influential allies. I can't say if we have God on our side, but at least we have the Pope and David Suzuki. <laughs> and that's a pretty good start. Thank you.